Yeah, good morning, folks. So my name's Tim Laleen, and um, I've, I'm an organizational development consultant. So I help individuals, teams, organizations get better at what they do, um, learn new things about themselves, and work more effectively. And this morning, in 45 minutes, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, psychological type um, and the MBTI. Has Ed, hands up if you've heard of MBTI. Keep your hands up if you've ever done the MBTI. Keep your hands up if you can remember your MBTI. Okay, good, excellent, excellent. I'll come to, okay, so you, you, everyone will still do your hand up. You are now experts like me. Okay, so I'll come back to you as we go through the talk. So I'm going to talk you through the type and the MBTI. They're not quite the same thing. Um, I'm just going to give a bit of general background on that. And as we go through, by the way, just hands up any questions as we go through. More than happy to answer them. I'll also stick around for five or ten minutes at the end. So if you want to know more about it in detail, come and see me afterwards. I'm, I'll answer anything you, you'd like about that. Um, I've got a lot of experience of um, setting up and running MBTI, for example, uh, and making it work so that years later people keep their hands up and re they remember what type they were. So if, you, if you're thinking about doing that or if you've got uh, internal clients who are thinking about doing that, come and speak to me. I'll tell you the best way to, to organize it. Um, I'm going to focus in on extroversion and introversion today. So type, there's lots of different dimensions to type, but I'm going to focus just on those two things because I think they're some of the things that we're most familiar with and perhaps, but perhaps some of the things that are most misunderstood. I'll look at E and I, extroversion, introversion, in terms of management roles. Um, if we have time, we'll have a bit of a discussion, some reflection, and then I'll wrap up. So as we go through, as I said, any questions at all? Um, and uh, yeah, let's, let's see what we can find out about type and extroversion and introversion and making teams work. Now, I should say, by the way, that the, the presentation is called Making Teams Work. What I really mean is making you work so that your team works. That's what I'm really talking about. Because you know, human beings aren't amoebas. Okay? You can't just kind of prod them and make them do stuff. It doesn't work like that. And actually, the last time I said that, um, there was a, a microbiologist in the room, and he said, actually, even amoebas aren't that simple. <laughs> so um, first of all, any questions? Has anyone come with any specific questions that they were hoping to have answered um, in the next 45 minutes about type or extroversion or teams? It's a room full of introversion. <laughs> Anyone at all? Any questions at all? Anything in your head? Any ponderings or wonderings about this stuff? No, Tim, just crack on. We haven't had enough coffee yet. OK, I will do. So um, if any occur to you, just ask me. Psychological type and the MBTI. So basically, these are not the same thing, although they're used interchangeably. So very often, people say MBTI, and what they mean is, is psychological type. OK, psychological type is a model invented by this guy. Hands up who's heard of Carl Jung. Excellent. OK, Carl Gustav Jung. Um, one of the sort of uh, early pioneers of psychology, um, psychotherapy in the first uh, very early part of the 20th century, the last, last few years of the 19th century. So Carl Gustav Jung um, invented word association as a therapeutic tool. So that's one of the things he did. Um, and he was uh, Freud's the other guy. So Jung and Freud worked together for a while until they had an argument about I think, uh, you know, length of beard or something. No, it was about the unconscious. Um, and then um, he came up with this idea of psychological type. OK, so what Jung did was he thought about his practice. He was a practicing psychotherapist. He thought about his practice. He thought about his observations of the world around him. And he tried to conceptualize, to create a model of how we interact with the world around us. OK, so it's a model. This is not a, a theory that's right or wrong. Okay, this is absolutely not about pigeonholing people or putting them into boxes. It's a way of modeling how we interact with our environment. That's, that's what type is. It's one of the 20 books that Jung wrote. So it's 5% of his thinking. He had a lot more deeper, more de sort of deeper ideas about the human psyche, about conscious, unconscious, our male and female sides, our, um, uh, the self and the shadow of the self. So it's a very complex psychological model that he's building up. Type is just part of that. So that's one of the points I want to make today. It's a, it's a hint, it's a part, it's an aspect of who we are, but it doesn't tell you every single little thing about you, OK? Um, first exercise. So I'd like you all to cross, so fold your arms, please. Can you all fold your arms? Excellent. That's a very compliant audience. That's good news. OK, everyone fold your arms. OK, now can you f fold them the other way, please? OK. How did it feel to fold them the other way? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. How else? Awkward. Had to think about it. Awkward. Say again? Conscious. Conscious. Very, uh, absolutely, yeah. You have to think about it consciously. Absolutely consciously. 
Did everyone manage to fold their arms the other way? No. Okay. Second, second, two goes. Two goes. But you did it eventually? Yeah. Okay. That's type. Okay, it's about comfort and, and what's easy to do and about what you have to think about and what takes time to do. That's, that's all type is about. So most of us will have a preferred type according to the model. According to Jung, there'll be, there'll be an aspect of ourselves which is kind of more dominant than the other. That's what type is. So, you know, there's a way we fold our arms and there's another way that we have to think about. That you have to think about. And sometimes it takes twice, but you get it there. Okay, that's what type is. It doesn't mean you can't do things. It doesn't limit you. And it shouldn't limit you, and you shouldn't think, I'm this type, I can't do anything else. Absolutely not true. And if anyone ever tells you that, they're flat out lying. That's not what type is. So Catherine Briggs and Isabel Briggs Myers. Um, Jung published Psychological Type in 1920. Uh, 21 was the English translation. Um, Briggs and Myers, mother and daughter, living on a university campus in the States. Um, and the mother was working on, um, so Catherine Briggs was working on her uh, own theory of personality. Okay, it's the 20s, that's what she's doing. Um, and then she came across Jung's model of type and thought, this is way better than anything I could come up with. So I'm going to go with this. And so she read it. And actually, psychological type is, is easy to read. I mean, you know, if you, if you, if it's, a, it's a good book. It's an interesting book. It's quite big, but it's quite interesting. But if you think about the 20s and the levels of literacy, um, then so Myers and Briggs said, you know, this book is great. Everyone should have access to this model, but not everyone can read it. So what they did was they tried to think of a way of codifying the model, okay, simplifying it for people. Um, and that's what they did, and it took them a few years. It was kind of the early 40s before they actually kind of managed to simplify it to the extent. They wanted to give people a quick and easy way to understand type. So I just said, you know, types, it's, it's simple. It's kind of, you know, what you're comfortable with. Now, what Jung says about type is, you come to know what your type is throughout your entire life, okay, through self-awareness. So thinking about how you are in situations, thinking about how you are with the outside world, you can come to know your type eventually after years. Um, therapy will help, Jung says, um, as well. To kind of, so it's about self-awareness and self-knowledge. Now, Myers and Briggs, um, maybe they're kind of typical go-getter Americans at the time, I don't know, but they're, they're saying, well, you know, a lifetime is not quick enough for us. We want people to understand really quickly. So they came up with this thing called the MBTI, and that stands for Myers Briggs Type Indicator. Those folks who put their hands up earlier who did that, they will have answered a list of questions which said, do you like this word or that word? What do you do in this situation? Do you do this or that? MBTI is a series of forced choice questions, and that's what they created. That's what the MBTI is. It's not the whole model, okay? It's just a list of questions, which is a, a very, very sort of accelerated process of self-reflection. It's not magic, okay? It doesn't tell you it's not magic. I, I really can't make, stress that point enough. It's a, it's a way of very quickly having a best guess of your type, which could be useful. Jung says, Myers-Briggs say, I happen to think so too. I find it very useful for self-awareness, for planning a session like this, for working with groups, for helping my team work, because I'm not just coming at it from one point of view. Okay, I'm thinking about multiple perspectives. I'm thinking about diverse perspectives, diverse experiences, and how I, as a manager, can get the best out of a team full of those things. Uh, another exercise, so I'd like you to all think of a number. Okay, either one, two, or three. Don't tell me, don't tell anyone. Okay, either one, two, or three. And what I'd like to do now is Turn around to the person next to you and shake their hand the number of times that you've thought of and see if it matches or not, okay? So just turn around, so if you're one, shake once, two, shake twice, three, shake three times. Okay. Has everyone had a good shake? Okay. Okay, who, who found someone with the same number of shakes as them? How did that feel? Right. Uh, brilliant, right, it felt right, it felt correct. Uh, who shook hands with someone who didn't have the same number of hands? How did that feel? Awkward. Anything else? Forced. Forced, forced. Anything else? Individual. It, yeah, individual different maybe. Anything else? Okay. So. Uh, just another kind of illustration about what happens when you, according to Jung's model, the Myers-Briggs model, when you run into someone with a different type, a very different type, it might just feel slightly odd. You're, kind of, you're not quite meeting them somehow. You know, you're not quite kind of on the same page, but you can't work out why. Um, when you meet someone who is the same type, you get on like a house on fire. And everything's fantastic, and you just, you just click. When you meet someone, you just click like that. Now, that's fantastic news. That means you get on really well. But what that means, if you have a team of people like that, 
you're missing, you have lots of blind spots because you're missing all these other types. So the point about type is you need a team with lots of different types. And actually, we have all the types in ourselves, so we can do that ourselves. We don't need to go and recruit. I need an E. Let's bring an E into the room because we need to talk. That's not how it works. So another example of type. And I'm just going to talk you very briefly through the Myers and Briggs model. So this is how they codified Jung's model. Okay? So folks with your four letters, um, I'll come to you in a second, so be ready. Uh, so extroversion, intuition, sensing, extroversion and uh, introversion, sensing and intuition, thinking and feeling, and judging and perceiving. So this is how Myers and Briggs have codified these things. So you can see there, they make, they kind of make a uh, very clear difference between extroversion on one hand and introversion on the other. So it's about extroversion is about the external world, introversion about the internal world. Sensing is about facts and data and detail, and intuition is about the future and possibility and patterns. Now, I have um, some handouts for this, so if you want to uh, grab this off, uh, uh, from me at the end, I, I can give you a handout. Um, but also, I think the uh, conference is going to make, make the presentations available. OK. Um, on the website. So thinking, analytical, logical, objective, and feeling is uh, subjective and people focused and focusing on value. So you can see there's, there's kind of distinctions they make there. So with the MBTI, you answer a load of questions. With the psychological type model, you continue to think about it. And you might decide, OK, which of these for me is dominant? So this is not about, um, I only do one. OK, I'm only one thing. Which is, which is the one I tend to use most? Which is the one that I've grown into using most? It's like the, the folding the hands. I can do both of them. So that's what the MBTI is about. And when you've done the assessment online, the indicator, or you've just thought about yourself because you've read Jung's book, you end up with four letters. OK? I'm just going to move this mouse pointer out of the way because it's annoying me slightly. Uh, so you end up with four letters. And this is the type table. So folks who remembered their type, if you're happy to, would anyone be happy to say what type they are on the table? Yeah. I'm an ESFJ. ESFJ. Yes. Interesting. OK. I might come back to you a bit later on on that. Yep. Um, mine changed. I was originally an ENTJ. Yep. And I became an ENTP. OK. ISTP. ISTP. OK. Anyone? No, okay, so it's fine. It's cool. Interestingly, the intro introvert, the last to speak, you see, very polite. <laughs> Let the extroverts jump in uh, to the situation, held back, and when they when they spoke, very kind of very very calm. But yeah, I'll just I'll just let them let them get out of the way first, and then I'll talk. So, um, yes, you come up with four letters. I'm INTP, so I'm according to I think probably this is the thing you never really know, but my best guess to date is I'm INTP. I think, or in Jung's terms. Um, it's uh, INTP would be um, introverted thinking with extroverted sensing. So that's the, that's the type model. I'm not going to go into detail on every single type. Um, but just to say, I think it's something that's useful for you at least do it once and have a read of the literature and think about what it might say about you and about your team, okay? about, about other people, about how you interact with people. But the point here also about the table is this type, so the... Um, ENFJ, for example, uh, ESFJ, do beg your pardon, um, or the INTP, is almost like your comfort zone in this model. Okay? So the further you go from your comfort zone, the more tiring it is, the more energy it requires. So it's a good, for me, it's a good uh, kind of indicator that if I do, I think probably as an introvert, if I do lots and lots and lots of conferences or speaking or seminars or whatever, I need to plan some breaks in where I can just have some time out. Otherwise, I'll just burn out if I do, do too much day after day after day. A conference like this is largely an extrovert experience. Um, there's lots of action. There's lots of speaking. There's lots of group stuff. And actually, at the end of the day, there's probably a networking session or a party or something like that. So you know, if you're one of the 80 or so who kind of stayed, stayed late last night, probably an extrovert, unless you're an introvert who, who you know, had lots of drink. But uh, basically, um, <laughs> I, would, I would guarantee that if, if at the end of today, you just want to go back to your room for just half an hour and just, just do nothing. That's probably a sign that, that introversion might be your preference. If at the end of the afternoon you kind of go, right, excellent, I want to go and tell all these people about this stuff. I'm going to phone people up and I'm, having the, I'm exaggerating, but probably extroversion. So all the introvert types are at the top of the table, extrovert types are at the bottom, OK? And I'm just going to talk briefly about introversion and extroversion in a bit more detail and then think about what that means for, for teams and for you as managers for you working as part of a team.
so the, the, the kind of cliche about extroverts is they talk, and I made a joke about it earlier. Look at the extroverts jumping in and talking, and the introvert waited patiently and then spoke. Um, like all cliches or stereotypes, there's a grain of truth in that. Extroversion is a, an overall uh, orientation, Jung called it, attunement, preference for, um, excitement by the external world. And introversion is about the internal world. That's, that's what it is. And for, for an extrovert, the first movement, as a po point there, is, is towards the external, towards the environment, in any situation, in any kind of conversation or situation. Extroverts are more than happy to jump in with both feet if they need to. They talk, think, talk, it says there. So they can think, note that, that's very important, okay? Some people think extroverts can't think because they're too busy talking, that's not true. Because talking is thinking. They're talking their thoughts out loud. Okay, they live in the external world, they tend to think and act in the external world. Introverts, the reverse is true, so they'll think and then they'll talk and then they'll think. So what does this mean if you're in a meeting? It means you need to make sure you leave some space if you're running a meeting. Interruption is a mode of conversation for extroverts. Interruption for extroverts is not rude, that's just how we're talking. We'll talk over each other, that's fine. But that, you know, of course you do, because you need, you've got something to say, why wouldn't you talk? If you're in the majority, and you're talking over each other, and there's no space, then the introverts will have no time to say what they think, or say what they feel, or make a contribution. So if you've ever got to the end of a meeting, and someone's been in the meeting and hasn't said anything for the entire meeting, and then comes up to you at the end and goes, oh, I wish I'd said this. That's probably because there wasn't enough space for them to speak. Now, there's other stuff going on, of course. There's all sorts of stuff around status and power and influence, um, all kinds of other reasons why someone might not speak, uh, or might not interact, why not jump in? But bear that in mind. Everything else being equal, give some space for the introverts. Uh, otherwise, they, you'll lose what they have to say. And actually, it's as valuable as what anyone else is saying. And it's useful for you to hear them. And very often more useful, because what introverts tend to do is process what they're hearing. And then come out with something which encapsulates, encapsulates what everyone else might have been saying, or encapsulates a, a, a very precise, concise uh, insight based on what they've heard. But you might lose that. Um, agendas are good as well. So um, who has an agenda for every single meeting they go to? Yeah, really? Every single meeting, even 10 minute long meetings, yeah? OK, Effie, very good. Um, even if it's just this is what the meeting's about, absolutely crucial for introverts to do their thinking beforehand. OK, absolutely crucial. It, it doesn't, I'm not talking days here. It's not like uh, I, just, I just need to go in this room for three days and think about the meeting and then I'll come out. It's not like that. Moments, minutes, uh, the day before if possible, but just something. So, because if, I, if I'm an introvert and I rock up to a meeting and you're all extroverts and you're like, oh, I oh know, we, we said the meeting was about this. Actually, let's talk about this. Let's have a massive conversation, brainstorm about this. Fantastic. I haven't done my thinking. Again, I might be less inclined, less confident in speaking, contributing. Now, if you're talking about a room full of experts, technical experts, or people who have you know, valuable information you need to make a decision, you need everyone's input. So make space. Literally, that means pausing, extroverts. Okay? That means pausing for longer than half a second. Okay? Count to two in your head. That'll feel like a long time. And, and then maybe count to, work up from there. Go five seconds, go 10 seconds, see how it goes. Leave some silence for people. So extroversion versus introversion. Um, so it's, not just about, it's not just about talking and being silent. I'm typifying that in some ways. It's about an entire kind of familiarity, comfort with either the external world or the internal world. Where's your preference? And we do both. This is the thing. And people talk about an, in, an introvert, an extrovert, and I did it just then as well, as shorthand. But just be really careful about the shorthand because we do both. In Jung's model, an aspect of ourselves is extroverted because we all deal with the outside world if we, you know, if we really have to, I will go and talk to people. Okay, I can do that. Um, and for extroverts, if I really have, yes, okay, I will be quiet. I'll listen and I'll think and I'll reflect. So we can do that. We can do both. But just have a think about your team. What's going on in your team? What's the, not just what are the individuals there, what's the prevalent culture of your team? Is it an extrovert culture or an introvert culture? And if it's one or the other, if it's predominantly one or the other, depending on what your task is or what model you're setting as the manager, what does that mean for the people in your team? Are there people who you are excluding by running things in a way which is comfortable to you and comfortable to the majority of people in your team? So um, it's not that simple, of course. Culture has an impact. Um, our previous experience has an impact. 
Uh, I just mentioned there at team culture, work cultures have a huge impact. I did some work years ago uh, for the prison service. And um, part of the work, it was a leadership development program for a prison uh, deputy governors who were about to make the jump to governor. Okay, now, first of all, the experience taught me a lot about assumptions because I based my entire understanding of the prison service on the, on the comedy series Porridge. And I thought that's what it was all going to be like. I thought they'd all be like Mr. Mackay. Um, and it's, com of course, complete nonsense. My assumptions, my stereotypes, my preconceptions just blown out of the water by some of the most amazing, kind of warm-hearted, inspirational people I'd met. And as part of the um, program, we did MBTI. It's a, it's, a, it's a very quick, good way of kind of getting conversation started. And almost every single one of them came out as ESTJ. First time round, ESTJ. Every single one, ESTJ. Which in a prison makes sense, okay? These are deputy governors, all right? They're the people who will be in charge of a prison. ESTJ makes sense. They're extroverted, so they can give orders, okay? Extroverted, interested in the outside. I'm not gonna hide in my study. I'm gonna get out there and tell people what to do. Um, sensing is about detail, facts, data. Very important, again, if you're a prison governor. Um, thinking, which is about logic, objectivity. Incredibly important. I need to be able to judge everything objectively. I need to adhere to the rules or regulations I need to apply equally to everyone. So, you know, again, a very useful type. Uh, and J, judgment, which is about decision and closure and structure and planning. So you can see ESTJ, what a great type for someone who's going to be a prison governor. Now, when we got to talk about it, actually, about half of them were and half of them weren't. And what had happened was that they'd begun to kind of act like that, behave like that, be influenced by the structures and the systems around them and the other people. So if you're, you know, you're f three or four people acting the same way and you're not, as managers, then you're influenced by them. You might begin to take on those characteristics. So they kind of, first of all, like, yeah, I'm ESTJ because I do this, this, and this. And actually, they were, a lot of them turned out to be ENFJ, ESFJ. There were differences than what they first thought. So culture is a big part. The other thing that Jung says is that we're, we're on a constant uh, ongoing journey he describes as individuation, the constant uh, experience of becoming the person we are, i.e. we change through our lives. We're not the same people. And in the first half of our lives, we work on our strengths. So in the, in the Myers-Briggs sense, we might be working on the four letters you can see there. Because in, in Myers-Briggs, the, the way they codified this thing, um, they give you four letters. And the other letters kind of vanish. And you're like, but hang on, I can... I'm an ISTJ, but actually I have feelings as well, and actually I, I, I can do intuition. Yeah, absolutely, they're still there, but they're just not as strong, they're not as dominant. So um, what Jung's saying is that in the first half of our lives, and he describes midlife as kind of between 30 and 50, depending on experience and what's going on and, and what you have to face, what you have to deal with. In the first half of our life, we're dealing with um, things which are, uh, we're dealing with the dominant side. So we kind of rely on our dominant side, our most preferred side, that top half, if you like, of the line, the conscious stuff, the stuff we're familiar with. That's how we charge through life. That's how we deal with things. And in the second half of our life, we start to explore the other side. So your ESTJ in the first half of, of their life, according to Jung, or someone with a preference for sensing, so data and concrete facts and detail, um, and thinking objectivity uh, and, and analytical uh, objectivity and logic, might begin to explore the other side. So, you know, tales of... Um, uh, kind of gregarious actuaries turning into remote sheep herders is, you know, it makes sense in a way. So it's not that simple. Culture has an impact on type. The people you're with has an impact on type. You, you, how you kind of focus on type, how you develop type, changes over your life. And the other thing to remember is we have all the types. Okay, we have all the types. So going back to that grid, and you end up with four letters on the Myers-Briggs codification of this, you have all the types as well. But it just takes you more energy to do them. Okay? So don't think if you've got an introvert in your team, they can't be a great public speaker. Don't think if you've got an extrovert in the team, they can't work on their own and uh, uh, on, kind of, on their own kind of reflectively thinking about a, a very particular problem. They can do. But it, will, it might cost more energy. It might tire them out. Think about yourselves. What are the things that you do which you find more or less tiring, which you find easy, or um, uh, we said at the beginning, Folden has a bit awkward, <coughs> not usual, not comfortable. You might have to do it a couple of times. Now, you know, we're all self-aware people. Um, you're at a stage of your careers where you've experienced lots of different things. You've seen yourself in lots of different situations. So, in a you know, in the particular moment, you might say, "Well, I kind of do this, but sometimes I do this, and I'm quite flexible." But what do you like when you're stressed? And what do you like when you're tired? And what do you like when you're in a hurry and you have no time to mess around? 
What do you like then? What do you default to? How, you know, what type do you revert to in that situation? And how often do you do it? Just something to think about. Because we all have our comfort zone, our default, our habit that we use. And the trick is, the way to make, get you working more effectively so that your team works more effectively, is to be aware of that and not to default to it. Not default to it because it's easier for you. Okay, if you default to it because it's the brilliant, it's the brilliant way of um, solving the situation and it works really well, that's fantastic. But why are you doing it that way? Is it for you? Is it for your team? Is it for the task? Is it because that's the best way of doing it? Or just because it's easier to fold, the, fold your arms that way? So self-awareness is just absolutely crucial in the moment. Why, why am I doing this this way? So Ashridge did a, um, some research a couple of years ago into the most common types of management roles. And those are the sort of the top five. The others get single figures, two or three percent. Those are the top five. Um, so you can see that two thirds are extrovert and a third are introvert. Now this, these, are, these are managers across, these are large organizations, private, public sector, and um, uh, higher education. So it's a real mix of senior managers, so uh, head of and deputy director level managers doing this. And that's how the results panned out. So thousand, I think there's sort of 6,000, something like that they did. So two thirds are extrovert, which kind of, again, like I said, kind of makes sense. But if you look again at these types, so these are the top, uh, the top five there. Thinking back or looking at the grid, we can see there that the ones at the bottom there are extrovert, and the ones at the top are introvert. But particularly folks who know their type, what's missing from the most popular management types there? Feelings. Feelings. Absolutely spot on. So empathy, subjectivity, the ability to see things from the other person's point of view. Now, of course, as I said, that doesn't mean they can't do that, but it means it's not what they would prefer to do. It's probably not a habit. It's not something that they automatically do. They might have to think about it or remind themselves to do it. <coughs> I had a coaching client years ago who was working in a team. And um, I was coaching him. Sometimes this happens. I, I sometimes coach managers because things aren't kind of quite working out. So their manager talks to them and they say, look, you know, maybe some coaching. So I come in. I don't, not, I don't always take those on because sometimes it's not, I don't think it's the right thing. But sometimes I do. And that was one of these occasions. And um, I talked to him and he'd, he'd been working for six months in this team. Uh, managing the team, there were some complaints about him, maybe verging on bullying. Um, and I sat down and said, you know, what's the problem from your perspective? What's, what's going on? And he said, they're just really annoying. I said, what, what, what's annoying about them? He said, every Monday morning I come in and all they want to talk about is the weekend. They spend, they spend 10 minutes, it's like quarter past nine before they do any work. All they're doing for the first 15 minutes, what happened? Where did you go? How are your children? He said, what's going on? It's ridiculous. I'm here to work. So <laughs> I said to him, well, maybe, maybe that is work. Maybe that's part of, of them being the team. Maybe it's important for them to know about each other. Well, that's ridiculous. OK, well, I'll tell you what. Let's just try you being, being interested for a few minutes every Monday morning. OK, I'll try that. So um, he tried being interested. I mean, he, he, you know, he really wasn't. Um, but he tried. He gave it a go um, and began to be better at it. So uh, six months as a coaching intervention. So um, by the end of it, he could sit down with his team and, and have a chat for five minutes on a Monday morning in a way that looks like he was genuinely interested in their lives. Um, now, we did some other things as well, but for him, that was an enormous struggle for him to see that as, to see that as work, see that as part of the team. And I would suggest, now that's, an, again, an extreme example, okay? And, um, and he didn't get sacked. He, did, he actually turned around. That was, the, that was the kind of way that we opened the conversation up for lots of other things. And we did use type in that case. I don't always use it. It's not always appropriate. But in that case, I used it because it made sense to him. Um, but if you think about these managers here, so you know, that's a big chunk of the management population who might not be defaulting to empathy, to feeling, to thinking about things from the other perspective, from the other point of view. Again, I'd suggest that there's possibly a chance there are people in your teams who are acting out of type, who aren't in the environment that they prefer, and potentially, at times, maybe getting sidelined because of that. And it's up to you as the manager to be aware of that and think about that. Now, I'm not suggesting you, if you've got a team of 10, you create 10 micro environments that are perfect for each person. You can't do that. But just have a think about just this one simple bit of type, introversion, extroversion. What am I doing? How's my environment set up? How are my meetings set up? How do I interact with people? Do I suddenly rush in and go, right, tell me what you think? And then people don't say anything, and, and then I get disappointed. 
you know, I've got a, I uh, had a client who was, uh, ran an IT company, small IT company, kind of coding software, and he would very often do that. He'd come back from a uh, he'd be at a conference or he'd be at a meeting or something. He'd come back really excited, super excited about what he'd, what he'd done at the meeting. Couldn't wait to tell the team. He'd rush into the room. They're in an open plan room, coding away. Um, and he'd go, oh, I've just done this. It's amazing. I met this client. We're going to do this fantastic project on this. And they, to them, it was just like, what are you doing? You're crazy, man. Um, and, uh, and after a while, they all started wearing headphones. <laughs> and he's like, my team hate me. They don't want to. I was like, no, it's not like that. OK, so um, how are you behaving? What's the impact on your team? What kind of environment are you creating by your behavior for people? Um, OK. I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. So um, I'm going to turn it over to you for about five minutes now. Well, let's say five minutes exactly. Um, what are your thoughts, reflections, ex personally? What are your experiences? What have you, what have you seen that this reminds you of? Uh, over to you. Just your last comment there about that sort of very extrovert manager. Just say the we both used to uh, work with Jeff one day a week, but we worked in a uh, previous company, and the, the CEO there was very, very um, exuberant, and he would come along, and he would just cringe. He was walking along, and he would just slap his hands on his shoulders and go, what are you doing? Where are you saving me money? What's the next? And he just would be straight in there, put you on the spot, and nobody wanted it. Everyone would just be trying to run and hide. It was horrible. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And if you think about the what kind of type of person might end up being a chief exec, or, or if it's their own company, setting up their own company, or starting something from scratch. What kind of type is that? Um, did, ha, did you ever tell him that? No. <laughs> Anyone else? What do you think? What, you know, reactions? Yeah. Going back to um, not being very empathetic or not being really interesting, and making yourself feel interesting. This is a game, by the way. <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> But you can sometimes pick up that that person is just saying it because that's what they're going to say. Absolutely. And that doesn't really help the team because they just think, well, that's just... They just think it's false. Uh, absolutely. You're absolutely right. And the same thing with feedback. Um, so the way that uh, people with thinking preference and feeling preference give feedback is very different. So a thinking preference person would give feedback like this. It, you know, all, all th you know, their default position would be, that's terrible, fix it. Okay, that's, that's feedback from a thinking A feeling person might be more interested in the person. How are you doing? What's going on? Um, you know, let's talk about this thing the other day. So it's a very different approach. Now, if one tries to fake the other, sometimes you can tell. We're, you know, we're, human beings are smart, right? We can pick up when someone's faking. We've been evolving this for millions of years. You know, we can spot patterns that aren't quite right. So you're absolutely right. You have to be very, very careful. I mean, with the example I mentioned, to be honest, fundamentally what I was, what I was getting to do to begin with is just be polite. And I think, you know, simply not, look, and not looking frustrated when someone said hello to him kind of thing, you know. So we were, we were working for a very low, very low start. Uh, this was years ago, by the way, so none of my current clients. Um, but, uh, but you're right, be careful. But I think you can... I think you can change. You can change how you are with other people. You can learn to be different with other people, but just take it slowly. I mean, the classic is someone goes on a, a course, you know, a leadership development course, and they come back and they're, right, I'm suddenly this person. I'm going to act like the complete finisher or this or whatever. Um, and everyone goes, oh, let's, you know, let's wait for this to calm down and they get back to normal. So you're right. It's not about suddenly changing to a completely different, but be aware of it. It's there in you. Okay? It's not. It's not an alien thing you have to pretend to be. It's there in you. You just have to kind of draw it out. So it takes time. But yeah, very valid. So I mean, I'd love to see your, your chief exec, if he'd suddenly gone on the course and said, oh, right, I must be uh, introverted and, and empathic now and see what he looked like after that, uh, whether you actually believed him. Um, OK, any other? Yeah. I think um, one of the most difficult things for us was if you set up a project and you said very clearly that we need to have different types of people hmm. to do different aspects and to interact and not have blind spots and all that stuff. And that's something you can plan if you're doing a project. Hmm. But if you then look at a work environment, which is a team, you probably can't plan that. You might inherit a team or, or whatever. Um, and so, so how do you deal with that situation? You plan for it very much on a project to have that mix of advice, etc. But you're literally left with the more harder task of fitting that five people in, hmm. and they are, they, you might have two or three the same. And yeah. You do want them to change, or you do want to interact differently. And I just wonder what kind of advice you would give to that. I mean, obviously, if you've got a, a tunnel where you can try and include 
um, mm. type indicator as part of your yeah. recruitment process. So uh, just on that last, so two points there, I think. Never recruit using type indicator, okay? Ever. Okay, you should, you should never, never, ever do that because it's a self-assessment of preferences. It doesn't tell you about ability or anything like that. I agree, it sounds like it might be a great idea because then I could have my perfect team. Um, there is a company that tried doing that several years ago, early 90s, when, when this kind of first got really big, and they tried to recruit just one type. Um, and the problem is, you don't know, how do you know if they're really that type? How do you know what type really means for that person? Um, and it doesn't predict performance or anything at all. So the thing about types, there's, there's 16 on that grid. Okay? So um, that's, that's not a massive number of types, but actually, are there more than 16 different types of people in the world? Yeah, I suggest there are. You know, if I'm an INTP and someone else is an INTP, that does not mean we're identical. That's like saying I'm David Beckham because I can kick a ball. Sadly, it's not true. Okay? We're not the same because we've had just our life experience has been different in all kinds of ways. So that's the first thing, okay? Never, ever, 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 ever. I'm normally pretty happy-go-lucky with stuff, right? But never use this for recruitment, ever. And if you go somewhere for a job, and they go, oh, here's the MBTI. Uh, you know, either it's a brilliant job, and you go, okay, I'll take it anyway. I don't care what Tim says. Um, just beware, because that means they're not using it properly, and it could be an indication, no pun intended, of what they think about other rules and regulations and ethics. So that's the first point, okay? You can't do that, I'm afraid, sorry. And, and the other thing is, there are 16 types, so in any team, you're never gonna have the type. So if your project team or whatever it is, most teams are a, a dinner table size, right? It's kind of six, seven, eight people. That's the manageable size for a team. You might end up with a big virtual team, which is huge, you know, huge, but generally speaking, in a small team, you're not gonna have all the types. But all of those people have all of the types in them. So it's about you as a manager introducing, making sure you're not just defaulting to one particular way of doing things. It's, I mean, it's hard work, it's not, there's no, I can't give you a kind of magic wand for this, but it's down to you as the manager to encourage flexibility in, in, the, in your team. Now you can do that in different ways by not having all of the meetings in the same way in the same place, by not approaching everything in the same way, by varying things, by having different, using different tools, different methodologies, um, but also one of the most important things you can do is by role modeling flexibility yourself. Role modeling the behavior you want to see in your team. When you, when you have more of an understanding of type, um, kind of a deeper understanding of type and the different types, it gives you like a mental checklist of, okay, what do I need to do, what do I need to make sure about here? And by encouraging different people, now you're not gonna change, this if some people just get stuck in their type, okay? If you've got someone who's in a particular type and have worked in roles throughout their career that suits that type, you're probably not gonna change them. You might come across them, but most people will be flexible. So give them opportunities to work in different ways and support them doing it. So, oh, I see you're an introverted um, uh, ISFJ. I'm gonna put you on a conference to talk about uh, analytical frameworks tomorrow with no practice and no support. Obviously, they'll fail and go, well, I'm never doing that again. So it's, it's a bit like any other development opportunity. Look out for something which will stretch them, but give them the support to help them succeed. And they'll discover that they can do other things. But then, you know, reinforce that with your own message. Does that, I'm, I'm conscious of time, but is that enough for now? I mean, it's, yeah. oh, and don't recruit using it. Did I say that? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> okay. Question. Very quick. Can I be the last one? Okay. I was wondering if a manager is a specific type and a very strong specific type, um, would they have a lot of blind spots? Yes. And would they then be willing to have a team that is very diverse, or would they be looking to have a team just as that one thing that they understand. Fantastic, fantastic point. Um, as a general rule, okay, forget MBTI for a second or type, but kind of just we have cognitive bias in our kind of the way we perceive the world, right? Um, we, we, are, we, we, we jump to conclusions, we make assumptions because our brains do not want to have to process every single tiny piece of information every time we meet someone or every time we go somewhere new. So we, we take shortcuts. And one of the unconscious ways we take shortcuts is that we, at times, will hire people in our own image. Because you think, oh, this, this person feels great, okay? You're gonna have to watch out for that. And so if you have someone who's a very strong type, uh, so when I, say, when I say strong type, what I mean is, let's say someone who has a particular type and who's never really explored the other, the other parts themselves, very perhaps set in their way, set in their type. Yeah, you might get a sense where actually they begin to feel uncomfortable. Do you remember the handshakes? So they might, uh, stupid example, but they, they might think, well, I don't really, I can't work with this person. They're not gonna fit with my team. 
So yeah, you might get a situation where they start employing people who are, who are like them. I'm talking unconsciously, it's not they haven't got MBTI or anything, they're just doing it, you know, and, and we might all fall into this trap. And then yes, you'll have a team of people who all think in the same way, you get groupthink, and you'll get blindsided, and it's, it's not great. So um, what can you do about that? As a manager, challenge yourself. Challenge yourself to be uncomfortable. Because it might be uncomfortable for you, but it might be better for your team. Okay. Does that answer your question? It does, yes. Okay. Thank you. So just before we finish, we've had a discussion. Um, I'd like you to spend two minutes reflecting now. So I'd like you to access your introverted side. And by reflecting, I don't mean thinking about the coffee break or checking your email. I mean, reflect on what you've just heard. Reflect on what you've been thinking as you've been listening to me. Reflect on what other people have said. What are you going to take away with you? What one thing are you going to take away from this? So for two minutes, I'd like you to reflect. Do nothing more than ref reflect. For some of you, this will be a challenge. For others, this will be coming, like coming home. So two minutes, just silent reflection. I'll let you know when it's over. And that was two minutes. And for some of you, 30 seconds was too long. Um, how often do you spend any time silently reflecting? How often does your team get to do that? Um, so if you are an extrovert, if that's your preference, learn how to look like you're silently reflecting <laughs> and, and thinking, quite, quite, mm, thinking about what your team are, are talking about. Um, if you're an introvert, push for more of that, because that's what you need to get through your day and to, to kind of be the best you can be. Um, any final comments, having had a chance, chance to reflect from anyone? It's a bit like a family, isn't it? A bit like a family? Yes. How so? Things are like a family, where you think you know everybody. Actually, they're constantly developing, changing their characteristics, and they need, and you need to change for management as people develop a job as well. So the observation is that teams are a bit like families. You think you really know people and then they surprise you and you think, hang on a minute, actually they're changing. Maybe I should change the way I do things. Um, okay. That's how long you have to leave silence for, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Quite a long time. It will feel odd to some of you. Thank you very much. So um, that was extroversion, introversion. Um, that's me, at Year One Team on Twitter. So um, do at me, follow us. Um, there's, we have uh, stuff every Friday about different themes. Um, and thank you for being a very um, engaged and respectful audience. Last point, 
Silence does not mean disengagement. Okay, last point from me, the number of times I've been called in by a manager to do an away day, and they go, oh, by the way, can you make sure everyone talks? I don't want anyone not, con not contributing, not taking part. Silence does not mean disengagement. Silent people can take part even though they're being silent. Okay, last warning for you. Right, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.